So we are the first one to really extend. You know, when you're offering the service, you have to make sure the network itself is secured. So let me, do you know, we'll focus on the network part of it today. We have taken a holistic approach. Is the network itself secured? Is your cloud secured? The IT tracking data that we collect, is that secured? So we're looking at end to end. Frankly, we are the only one in the industry the user tracking data is secured using what we call bring your own case. With the, in the interest of the time, let's talk about the networking problems that we have in the, sec in the security space. Your underlying infrastructure, the network, today, yeah, Ali and the team, I want to hear from you. But can I walk into many buildings, connect to the Ethernet port, am I on the network? With a highly likely 99% of the time, I'm already in the network. Or if I take out a printer port and connect it, I'm on the network. First thing, what happens? I discover the, all the resources on the network and contaminate, propagate the ransomware. Today, that's the most common. You cannot prevent that happening. And uh, is every user authenticated, authorized? The answer is no. On the wired, it's extremely difficult to authenticate, authorize. Can you guarantee that the network traffic, you know, Jay, I think you asked, can you guarantee that nobody can snoop your traffic? Can you guarantee that there's no man in the middle attack? Can you guarantee that there's no rogue access point? On top of that, once users are on the network, can you guarantee that there's no ransomware propagating in your network? Can you make sure that the communication between users and devices is, is secured? So we extended the zero trust principles on the, you know, the network itself. There is no configuration, the ports, the, uh, the IP addresses, none of that is configured by the customer. What we call the port is in a limited open port. You can connect your, wired dev your devices. If your device does dot one x, we allow you to do dot one x. If your device does Mac auth, we do the Mac auth. If you do, we extend it single sign on. If it does, we allow you to do single sign on. Or if not, you wait for a user to uh, admin to approve it. And absolutely zero infrastructure access, as we talked about. There's no management port. There's no console port. There's no TAC acts. You know, you can put all barriers you want. You can always get inside. In our case, we completely eliminated and absolutely zero snooping. So Jay, to answer your question, we have Mac auth from starting from the AP, sorry, uh, MacSec starting from the AP all the way to, uh, until it leads the Nile service block. Every traffic is encrypted by the hardware, not by the software. So there's no performance impact. And every user and device is authenticated, authorized. Absolutely no way one can get on the network without having, you know, uh, without having um, authorized access. And network as an application, you know, today we use a single sign-on to get onto the application. Why can't we use the same model to get onto the network? So we extended single sign-on, including adaptive MFA. So uh, Stanford, they, they, their users, or their students, get onto the network using the single sign-on. They use Duo as a second factor authentication, and those are the mechanisms they get on the network. And not just when they get on the network, you need to continuously authorize it. We use what we call first-stop security principles to make sure your identity is nobody is spoofing. On top of that, zero trust policy. You know, when you think of the zero trust principles, I'm right, you have to isolate every user and device. This is different from the segmentation. Yes, you can put the groups and device, you know, users into groups and devices into groups, but we isolate every user and device from each other. And only when you allow the users' devices to communicate with each other, only then they can communicate to each other. With that, I'll let Todd go into a little bit more detail. Yeah, I'll go into a little bit more technical detail, answer any questions that you guys have about security. We've talked about some of this stuff already, but I'll start out with just kind of explaining there's a TPM chip in every Nile device. Every device we ship has a TPM chip in it. As Promote was talking about, our software versioning is at, uh, at the manufacturer as well, right? So as we manufacture hardware, they reach out to our cloud, they get a certificate issued from our cloud, there's signature information that goes for that hardware, right? So it's tamper-resistant hardware all the way from the factory, all the way to us. We have the capability to, to um, double check on that, right? Also secured boot. So we use that TPM chip for a lot of things. Um, secured boot is one of those things. So we can check basically whether this is Nile signed software that's actually being delivered because we deliver all of that software, right? It's a really big thing to talk about all of our customers being on the same software version, right? So if there's a security patch that comes out, we're not asking our customers to go out and pull a new software version, right? We're pushing the new software version. We're doing that in a very safe way. We talked about kind of the canary deployment method, right? But we're doing that in a very safe way and a measured way, but we're making sure that you have the right security patches at all times as well. And then from a black box perspective, we bring these things online, these devices online, you can't access them locally anymore. You can't SSH into them, there's no web interface, there's no console port, you can look, they're right over there, there's no console port on these devices at all. So there's no local access to these devices, right? So they're hardened devices uh, from a management perspective as well. 
We talked about this a little bit, but to go into a little bit more depth, when we install a Nile device and it connects to another Nile device locally, those two devices authenticate to one another. All right, so our cloud knows that there's this switch is supposed to be at this customer location. So that switch will not, you can't pick up a Nile switch or a Nile AP from another customer location, plug it in at your location and it work. It won't work because we already know where those devices are supposed to be. They always authenticate to the cloud. So the devices authenticate one another and then they authenticate to the cloud as well and they form an encrypted channel to the cloud. So talking so, about encryption. Quick question there. Mm -hmm. So if I have like, in, even in between, like if I have two different sites, I can't even move between the two sites? Nope, because they're, well, so what we can do from our side, like if we know that there's, there's you know, a problem with a switch and we've got a spare switch at a location, right? right. And you wanted to be, to be able to deploy that switch at a new location, we have the capability to reprovision that. We basically just activate it at a new location and it will come up at that location. But if that's not activated, in other words, in our cloud, we don't think that switch is supposed to be there, it won't work there. Right. So those things authenticate to one another, and then we've patented the, the ability to automatically negotiate MACSEC between devices. So as these guys were saying, it's it really kind of a black box internally. We spin up a new AP, we connect that AP. By the way, every single port on all of our access switches capable of doing MACSEC. It's not three ports on the front, it's all 48 ports on the front of that device are capable of doing MACSEC. Doesn't matter where the AP is plugged in, it negotiates MACSEC, it encrypts all the data to the switch, and then the switch encrypts all the data to the next switch all the way until it ends the, gets to the other end of the null service block, right? All automatically negotiated, nobody has to configure anything, we don't, you don't have to configure anything. All right, going really fast. So, um, the, in Nile, the network that a device connects to is not determined by its location. It's not determined by where it's physically plugged in, right? Because that's not really relevant to what that device is. Everything is, everything is based on identity, okay? So again, speaking of wired devices, because that's kind of the hardest one, I plug in a device, I authenticate that device, and that device joins a network. If I unplug that device from one port, plug it into another port, I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to reconfigure. It's automatically in the right network because we're doing that based on identity. So let's talk a little bit about how we do that. For user-facing devices, right, like the laptops that, that you guys are on, um, if there is, if you guys have a Radius server, traditional NAC will integrate with that Radius server. Now, we'll vastly simplify the configuration of that Radius server because you guys are going to see some of the security that's already built in. We're not relying on your NAC for security automation. We're just relying on your NAC to authenticate that device or that user and then tell us what, what network that has to go in. I had one customer at one point tell me that they felt like NAC was a thing of the past, that it was dead, that it was over, it was too complex. We've been using Radius for a really long time, you know, probably 20 years now. We've actually thought of a way, we think, to treat the network more like a modern application, and that's with single sign-on. So user joins a wireless network, whether it's an open wireless network, pre-shared key wireless network, we can have it so when they join that network, your SAML-based SSO will pop up basically like a captive portal to them, right? They log into their SAML-based SSO, and they, they're allowed on the network in the, right, uh, in the right context, right, in the right segment um, for whatever you guys authenticated them for. That also means that we can leverage a lot of the capabilities of SSO, like impossible move. If somebody was at, you know, the San Francisco office five minutes ago, and now they're at the Atlanta office, that's impossible. So let's look at ways to authenticate them further, right, like adaptive MFA or something like that. So we can leverage all of those capabilities of a modern SSO-based system through that. We also, we also obviously support either your captive portal or we have some built-in captive portal capabilities like you guys have seen. For headless devices, we well, for all devices, we actually do a device fingerprint. So we are in the middle of this network, so it's not just DHCP fingerprinting that we're doing. We're actually looking at the traffic coming from the device. We can determine what a device is and fingerprint it. You guys saw some of that on the devices page that we showed earlier. So we can fingerprint a device and then we can actually utilize that fingerprint information to do like a continuous authentication. If this was a printer five minutes ago, it unplugged and it plugged back in as a Kali Linux box, that's probably not the same device, right? And so let's make sure that we're not allowing that thing on the network. So we're doing device fingerprinting and leveraging that alongside uh, the MAC address bypass that's built in. So we've got MAC, MAC authentication built in as well, very, very simple. You, you guys plug in a device, user plugs in a device, it shows up in the portal, shows as uh, in waiting for approval. You click approve, you tell us what network it goes in, doesn't matter from that point forward what port it plugs into on whatever switch, it always goes into that network, right? No need to reconfigure ports to make that happen. So we've got admin approval and we do have the capability for users to self-register devices. Um, so if a user has an Xbox in their dorm room, for example, they plug in that Xbox, 
they will have the capability to go in and actually approve that uh, to approve that on the network and we'll apply some security controls around that that I'll talk about in just a second. Finally, on the screen, we're talking, uh, we're doing continuous monitoring and first hop security, right? So again, we're in the middle for DHCP, we're in the middle for ARP, we're in the middle for all those things. So we can actually tell if someone's trying to do ARP poisoning, if somebody's trying to, um, you know, hijack, hijack an IP address somewhere, do whatever they're trying to do from a, from a Mac perspective, from an ARP perspective, we can actually uh, fix that with first hop security. Okay, moving on from that. Um, I think this one's really interesting, and this might actually raise a lot of questions, so I'm going to lay just a little bit of groundwork. First thing to recognize is that um, in 2023, I don't know if you guys realize it, but the first time that uh, VLANs were described in an RFC was in an RFC that was approved in 1998. Happy 25th anniversary to VLANs. Um, this, VLANs were not designed to solve the problems that we have today, and attackers know this, right? So. Somebody walks into a network, traditional network, with you know employee VLAN, right? Whether they're joining the employee network, employee wireless network, or the employee wired network, and they have malware on their device, it's very, very simple for them to spread that malware to someone else that's inside the environment, right? And in the vast majority of our customer environments, they would not realize that, right? They, if that data was on a VLAN, they would never see that. They would never see that traffic move, uh, move east and west. They would only see it once it started trying to attack something through, through a security boundary somewhere, right? But it turns out we're not running Windows 3.1 anymore. And yes, I'm that old, I remember it. Um, but I don't need to access a file share on one of you guys' computers just because we're on the same network, right? The reason that we put people on the same networks and devices on the same networks is for things like QoS, and it's also for understanding what that device is once we get to a security boundary, just based on its IP address, right? Groups of IP addresses. Um, the vast majority of the traffic that is originating inside corporate environments these days is going north-south. It's not going east-west, right? It's going through a firewall somewhere, legitimate traffic. So we've realized traffic needs full inspection by a firewall or at least some sort of centralized policy inform enforcement. So what Nial does is by default with no configuration from our customers, we isolate devices from one, one another. We do host-based isolation by default without the, without the customer having to configure anything. Now we do this a little bit differently than you might expect, but again, we've talked about this all day. We're layer three by default, right? We do everything layer three. So what we're actually doing as a first option, take that away, option one will actually send all of the traffic to your firewall. Even traffic within the same network, tr same traditional VLAN, will send it all to the firewall, right? Again, more than 90% of the traffic is moving north-south anyway. Everything else that's moving east-west in, in a traditional corporate environment is like print jobs, right? Or maybe screen sharing. So why not send all that traffic to the firewall, which by the way, is the most powerful security device on your network, has a lot more capability than anybody switch does um, to do inspection and do control, right? So we'll send all that traffic to the firewall. Option number two, and this is the thing that I was excited to tell you guys about because I'm, we're announcing it here for the very first time that we're going to have the ability to do micro segmentation within the Nile service block without, without ever sending that traffic up to the firewall, right? So if you have concerns that we're gonna crush your firewall, sending all of your traffic north to that firewall, we will have granular control of that traffic within the Nile service block configured in a very, very simple way, much more simply than all the ACLs that you guys might be dealing with right now. I know you're short on time, but real quick, could you explain how that micro segmentation is being achieved? Um, this might help. So this next slide was a little bit more detail on that. <laughs> so a couple of things. So first of all, you're going to be able to apply uh, policies for all the east-west communication that's happening within the Nile service block, right? And the, you, what you can tell us is, what do you want to happen by default? If I don't match a policy on this, you know, in my firewall rules here, what do you want me to do with that traffic? I can drop it. That's fine. Or I can just send that traffic to the firewall, right? So I might write, write an allow rule that says, okay, these IP cameras are allowed to talk to this uh, NVR over here, and I'll do that within the switching fabric. But as soon as you know any other communication needs to happen, shoot that to my firewall, I wanna inspect it, right? So I, we've got the capability to do that. We can also block or allow um, uh, east-west communication based on different attributes. So there are certain things that I'm not going to be able to talk about in depth today just because it's not really, you know, not quite released yet. We're going to, you're probably going to see this in the next 
few weeks, right? This is going to be rolling out for everyone. Um, but basically, we'll be able to create uh, device groups or user groups based on what you guys have, like an Active Directory, pulling that data using Skim from your Active Directory, right? And then create those user and device groups internally and control communication within those groups based on port and protocol. We'll even be able to do that unidirectionally. It's important in manufacturing sometimes. That's why they use things like data diodes. You can say, all right, I want this traffic only going out. I don't want to allow anything back into this device. So we have the capability to do that. Um, and we also have the capability to create what we call trust circles, which are if I'm you know, a student and I do that self-registration thing that I talked about just a little bit earlier, then we will allow that student to talk to that device that they, that they registered, but no one else is allowed to talk to that device that they registered. So we'll auto-create some of those rules when we do things like, like self-registration. All make sense? I think I'm actually getting pretty good on time. I've almost caught up. Um, all right, so finally, this is a core tenant for Nile. We are very, very security focused. We've been very security focused from the very beginning. And we are adamant that our customers' data is their data. It's not our data. We're never, ever selling any of our customer data. In fact, we're not even collecting customer data, right? We send metadata to the cloud for troubleshooting purposes, for uh, the purposes of you know, our customers getting visibility into their environments, but we're not sending our customer data to the cloud ever. Uh, unless you do the guest portal thing, but your internal traffic is never going to the cloud, okay? We also encrypt that data with individual keys on a per customer basis. So every single customer's uh, personally identifiable data is encrypted per customer with, with an individual key. We can't even access that data unless the customer goes into the portal and they allow it. And by default, there's a drop down where they can say, I want Niall to have access to this data for a day to help me troubleshoot something, right? And after that day is done, that access expires, we no longer have access to it. Finally, um, we allow our customers to bring their own keys uh, for the encryption of that data. So when a customer on boards with us, they can say, we want, we want you to use our you know, key from our Amazon environment to encrypt the data. If they ever need to revoke that key, nobody else is ever accessing that data anymore. Um, I won't go over these in depth. We've got the certifications to show that we're actually protecting this data. SOC 2 Type 2, that one took a really long time, obviously. ISO 27001, we've got the certifications. We can go in depth on that in another time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> and quickly, I want to wrap it up and say that, you know, uh, first of all, the couple of myths. One is, hey, is it only for small and medium business? The answer is no. We designed it for high-end enterprises. We have customers, Fortune 50 customers and Fortune 500 customers leveraging it. And we also, there's a myth that, hey, is it only for Greenfield? The answer is no. Promoth clarified that it's for Greenfield as well as Brownfield. We, most of our deployments are in Brownfield. With that, thank you, Tom. Thank you, team. And thank you, delegates, for your time. And also all, all the audience that is watching us over the internet. Thank you very much.